Hey, Tamara. I love this photo. I'm gonna give everyone a few more minutes to sign in. As you guys are joining in, tell us where you're from where are you logging in from? I just happen to be logging in from Spain where it's 2 a.m. Uh, here. I love Brittany from Miami. Ooh, yeah. I went to college in Miami. <laughs> um, yes, right, I saw that. We have Florida. I'm really from Maryland, but representing uh, Spain, I guess Honolulu, how exciting. I think I saw Nashville, but I think you're from the DMV, like where I live. Montana, very nice. One of the few states I haven't visited yet. Atlanta. 
a place that we've all visited. Brooklyn again, nice. LaGrange, Georgia. Indiana. Okay, the Midwest is checking in. Now we see Brooklyn, hey. Australia, very nice. Let's see if the number of participants has slowed down for us. It looks like we have a stable group. Um, and we'll, should we go ahead and get started? I think we could probably get started with our introductions. And hello everyone, I'm Dr. Shoshana Kindred, board certified dermatologist practicing in uh, Columbia, Maryland, which is midway between DC and Baltimore. Also an assistant professor at Howard University in the Department of Dermatology and previous chair of the dermatology section for the National Medical Association and currently the founding president for Onyx Medical Society. There's some other stuff, but that's enough. And I'd like to introduce also Dr. Tamara James Todd, who I just adore her, love learning from her. She has been talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals, products, et cetera, and how it affects pregnancy before it became as mainstream. She's really uh, one of the reasons why I became involved in it. So I look forward to hearing from her. We also have Jasmine Alvarez here. Hello. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very fitting, Jasmine, your mother was a hairdresser, right? And so and you're in the, um, uh, Jasmine also is quite passionate about clean products and she has her own personal story that helped to lead her here. And then we have Tam LaMare, registered nurse, medical esthetician. And she actually worked in a med spa. She also trained in Florida as well for several years. So we have two, um, uh, I guess three of us who are on the scientific medical side, but two who are in the industry with Tam and Jasmine. So we will go ahead and get started. And Dr. James Todd, I'm actually gonna throw the first question to you. And that is just to get us grounded. Could you explain to all of us what is meant by clean beauty products? Um, Shoshana, it's so wonderful to join you all this evening. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, and um, I think you started off with a really hard question. <laughs> um, about a year or so ago, I participated in an event that um, was really highlighting um, Clean Beauty, an organization that many of us are familiar with, um, um, and I can say like the Honest Company, and they really raised issues around the lack of definition for what it means um, when we say clean beauty. So I think to the consumer, that can often mean something like natural or organic products, um, and the challenge there is what does it actually mean to the companies? What does it mean to the retailers? What does the terminology natural or organic mean? Um, there are no, you know, requirements or stipulations around that. Um, uh, prior to December 29th of 2022, um, laws around regulations for what, um, could and could not be added um, into our products and what's kind of regulated by the Food and Drug Administration had not changed since 1938. Mm -hmm. um, we recently had the passing of the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act of 2022, or MOCRA, and there have been some um, updates, but that hasn't changed how we go about defining clean. clean. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I do think that that's a part of the challenge in really being able, at least for consumers, um, for you know, women of color, people of color, to really identify safer products that um, you know contain fewer or no toxic ingredients. That's what it comes down to for at least for a lot of us dermatologists. We're not worried about it being natural or not. We just want to know if it's toxic or not. And so we tend not to use words like natural because it's been so adulterated. Um, 
Tam and Jasmine, since you guys are in the industry, um, give us your feedback on what do you think is meant by the term clean skincare products? So um, it's interesting. So it's true. Everything, everything that um, Dr. James Todd mentioned is absolutely correct. And I think one of the, the challenges around what I do specifically as a, as a clean beauty retailer is that every retailer, every brand, and every individual consumer has their own definition, their own standard, and they're kind of all over the board. <laughs> And so what ends up happening is that the consumer just becomes confused. They become overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they become confused. And what we're seeing in the clean beauty industry is that there has been a, such a rapid growth in the market in terms of the demand for clean beauty. So as a result, we're seeing more and more brands showing up in the market. Brands that necess don't necessarily fill a real white space and it's just causing more noise. And... Um, mm -hmm. You know, my mission with Pretty Well Beauty was very, very simple, was to, one, clean up the noise, and by doing that, focusing on narrowing in on the brands that I know are going above and beyond just your table stakes of what we call clean beauty. And what I mean by that is that they're never satisfied. They're always looking for ways to continuously improve and innovate in their formulations. And if that sometimes mean, means changing out one aloe supplier for another because you found an aloe supplier that uses more ethical, more sustainable practices and how they um, source their, that ingredient, that's what they're going to do. These are not brands that just like sort of rest on their laurels, create a product and then like, okay, like we're mm -hmm. good, people are buying it. No, when they find a way to continuously make it even better, they're gonna do that if, they're, if, if that is something that they come across. And I love working with brands like that um, it, it shows that they are truly invested not only in um, what they're putting out into the world, but also into their consumer as well, to making sure that they're safe, that they're healthy, and that there's no um, major negative impact on the environment as well. And that's a whole other topic, the environmental impact that the beauty industry has. It's such a huge, mm -hmm. it's like the number two most wasteful industry that we have. And so the other part of it is to democratize clean beauty. Um, I don't know about the, the guests here, but I know people on this panel are women of color and using plant-based remedies for the way we care for ourselves as well as how we um, you know, beautify ourselves has been something that's been passed on from generations to generations. Um, but in the clean beauty industry, the majority of the people that we see representing this thing that we've been doing, that we've learned from our ancestors has been overrun and capitalized by people who don't look like us. So we're getting information that is kind of all over the board. We're getting bombarded with brand after brand that's entering the market. We don't have a real legal definition for what clean is. And then we have people selling it to us that have no real connection to these ingredients. And mm -hmm. that's a problem. And so that's the problem that I'm solving with Pretty Well Beauty by curating these brands that I know are truly safe, completely clean. And what I mean by that, I mean, these are, these are products that are formulated with ingredients that are only necessary, nothing, no fillers. Um, there are good synthetics up there, not all synthetics are terrible and they do serve a purpose, but they're free of anything that could be potentially harmful for human consumption as well as for the environment. And that's really how Clean beauty, in my my opinion, that's how I define it. And that's what I look for in the brands that I carry. And I make zero compromises with that. So a lot of clean beauty retailers, some of the bigger ones, they do make compromises because the brand is very popular. Um, and so they'll make concessions for them. I will never do that. Um, and so there's that's why there's some brands that are at some of the other retailers that I just would never carry, even though I know that I could and I would make a lot of money but that's not what I'm doing this for. So right. that's kind of like a long-winded <laughs> way of responding to your question. And uh, Tam, uh, what is your take on clean beauty? I thought I saw Tam on here. She's not on here. Let me just check you guys. Okay, so we'll go to the next part. I actually don't see her on here. And there's just some questions um, which uh, we alluded to. Um, Dr. James Todd, can you 
give us specific examples of um, products that may lead to adverse maternal outcomes? So, you know, our lab, I run the Environmental Reproductive Justice Lab at um, Harvard Chan um, School of Public Health. And our lab, along with others, have been really studying um, the impact of personal care product chemicals. So these, you know, skin care, hair care products, and um, various ingredients are added in. Um, I don't know if folks are maybe are at home or, you know, if you're not at home, definitely take a look when you get home, turn it over to the, the label and you'll see many, many, many different, you know, ingredients or chemicals. And, and some of those things are safer than others. Um, some of them are not here in the United States, at least required to be listed on the label. So for example, um, the term fragrance contains mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, dozens to hundreds of different uh, chemicals. And that doesn't, there's no requirement to disclose what is in there. Oftentimes that's synonymous with things like um, these chemicals called phthalates, which essentially hold the fragrance into the personal care product. I know growing up, I used to love using those different lotions, like the Bath and Body Works and all that, you know, other stuff. And the, the truth be told, I think many of us have an idea of what makes us feel beautiful or what clean smells like, because it's, I, I think even in, within our homes, there are certain products that we are, we use in our homes, you know, that's mm -hmm. what clean mm -hmm. is. Um, and so what we found, for example, with these phthalates or kind of fragrance associated um, um, chemicals that are in personal care products, our associations um, um, with birth outcomes ranging from um, earlier gestational age, so preterm birth related factors, um, lower birth weight, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia. We're also finding associations with postpartum health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about the link between um, conditions that really adversely impact women of color, one of the things I like to bring to the table or try to bring to the table for folks is um, one, um, in an example from a recent study of over 6,000 um, individuals that we're finding is that, for example, women of color have much higher concentrations of these chemicals. Um, mm -hmm. We can see that when we are able to reduce that concentrations, those levels, um, based on some kind of statistical models, that the preterm birth risk actually decreases. Mm. So, for example, Black women are 50% more likely to experience a preterm birth. So if we were able to, you know, help people identify products that contain more of these chemicals like phthalates and really reduce the exposure to these fragrance products, we might be able to reduce some of the health disparity that we see um, with, respect to, with respect to this. So I think that's critically important because whether we're talking about the black maternal uh, mortality crisis, where we know that a lot of the drivers are cardiovascular related and these chemicals are linked to cardiovascular related risk factors. I mentioned just one class of chemicals, there's other things like parabens, um, other, you know, um, triclosan, other things that are in these products that maybe folks, you know, again, take a look at the back of your um, containers, parabens are used because they're antimicrobials. We put our hands in our skincare products. It kills off the bacteria, but at what cost to us do we, do we add these types of synthetic chemicals to our products that can impact our health? So those are some examples um, of, of what, you know, I think places and spaces in which we can intervene, do a better job, get some of these chemicals that have been, you know, uh, banned in other countries. The European Union has banned things like phthalates and, mm -hmm. and parabens. So why in mm -hmm. the United States are we still not only using these products, but we're overexposing whole populations of people um, to these and with real consequence for pregnancy health. And hiding that it's included in the product, right? Like how much further can you go with this? So I guess that ties into prevention. Right, like you said, look at the ingredient list, but as soon as it says fragrance, that automatically means you do not know what's in there. 
And as Jasmine was pointing out, how um, there's been certain traditions passed down from one generation to the other, where we know exactly what's in our what's in our um, our products, what's in our skincare products. Um, I also uh -huh. wanted to veggie back off of what Dr. James Todd was saying about the the chemical bans, um, like the EU, they've banned over thirteen hundred known. Um, toxic ingredients in, in skincare or beauty and personal care. And out of those, the United States has only banned nine of those ingredients. So that's a huge disparity um, right there. And also um, when it comes to the formulation of conventional beauty products that are marketed towards women of color, they contain about nine times the amount of parabens than products that are marketed towards non- women of color. And that's a huge disparity as well, which is why I always try to encourage people to read what's on your products. Like if you don't do anything else, just look at the ingredients, you're going to see a whole list of ingredients. And if you don't want, if you don't know what they are, if you don't recognize them, I'm not going to say that it's automatically bad because a lot of beauty products will use the Latin root words of these ingredients instead of their common or layman term. Um, but just Google them. Like that's what I started doing years ago because I really wanted to understand what it is that I was using in my products. And I try to make a really uh, helpful guide for people. So on our website, mm -hmm. we have what's called an aware list. And it's a list of ingredients that um, we don't allow at Pretty Well Beauty. And it it'll it's a good little cheat sheet. So you can kind of Click on it, you can see what the ingredient is, what it does, what kind of products you would typically find them mm -hmm. in, what the potential hazards are. Um, mm -hmm. So this is really great, cheat, like a cheat sheet for people who really wanna understand what's in the products that they're using and what they could, they wanna try to avoid. And fragrance is like number, that's one of my top ones that, that's like an easy one to like avoid because it's always gonna say fragrance or perfume or parfum. If you see that, don't buy it means it. you don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. So that let's do you this just don't um, know. for both of you. Let's just and this is recorded, so people can go back and listen to it. But could we rattle off just a list? What is this list of things that um, the consumer should avoid? We've listed some, right? Um, we've listed phthalates, parabens, but could you just rattle off? what they should look for yeah. and just avoid in their products. Formaldehyde, formaldehyde, phenoxephenol, which is phenoxephenol is kind of a controversial ingredient, at least in the clean beauty space, because there was a time when that ingredient was considered safe. A lot of clean brands or clean brands um, use it and were using it and are still using it, even though there has been data that's linked it to neurotoxicity and like delayed fertility in women um you know a lot of like a hard thing a lot of women have a hard time getting rid of is the nail polish people ask me like jasmine is there like a natural non-toxic nail polish like which one should i use none of them like there's no such thing as a non-toxic nail polish it's it's Tidy. a varnish it's a varnish that is a byproduct of the car painting industry they're like in order for color to bind to the nail and not wash up under water that requires a very harsh chemical or a collection of them. So the other safer ones, you have the 10 free, the 10, you know, the 12 free, whatever. But if you really want to be safe, just, I would avoid it. Like I never wear a nail polish. So, um, you know, dioxanes, um, hydroquinone, that's a big one within the, you know, the, the, you know, people of color industry for skin lightening for discoloration these are these are just a few that's just off the top of my head oh let's pause there so what is the effect of the hydroquinone oh it has that's huge a popular adverse, one. Um, it's a very popular one it's, it has a it's very hard on the liver it has a lot of adverse effects on the liver which as you guys know is responsible for you know removing toxic waste and excess, you know, bacteria and like everything from the body. It's very, very heavy on the liver when you use hydroquinone. It's also sensitized, makes the skin more sensitive to the sun too, sort of like how retinol can do as well. Um, it's just, it's 
it's not a safe ingredient. There are safer ingredients that you can use if you want to lighten dark marks. It's a little bit of a slower process, but they work. So let's go back to formaldehyde. What I want to point out is that, um, you know, your product is not going to say formaldehyde. It's going to have one of the synonyms. Um, could you guys share those synonyms for formaldehyde? So I just want to bring attention to, and, and, and I think it's really important to like set the context. I think your question is an important question, um, Shoshana. And please call me Tamara. Um, just, you know, um, I think one of the challenges that we have is that the average consumer, as educated as we all are, is going to not really be able to turn you know, the, their, their bottle completely over and like avoid everything. And that includes not just formaldehyde, for example, or formaldehyde releasing um, products, because there are products that release formaldehyde after, you know, um, they're fully really activated. Um, think of, for example, chemical hair straighteners, you know, like the, it's the combination of the ingredients that uh, causes that type of chemical mm -hmm. reaction. Um, so that's not going to be listed on something. So our ability to fully avoid these things is, is challenged by that. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that you can't, you know, utilize resources that we're talking about today. I mean, another resource is this um, red list that we can get into um, a bit that's, uh, you know, again, a, a, a list of, you know, chemicals of concern that, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics released um, back in August of, of this past year. Um, again, you know, take opportunity to do what you can. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we can do is really push for additional policy changes that will ensure that we don't add these, pro these chemicals to our products because expecting, you know, a consumer to be a chemist on top of all the other hats that they have to wear um, in the context of pregnancy, in the context of being a parent and, and beyond, I think is very unreasonable and is, is should not be. Where, well, you know, we just tell, we just tell the consumers, turn it over and look at the list. So I think that's list. part of it, right? Like so it's, it's, we have to give them, what are they looking for? Yeah. Right? So I think to do that, what are they looking for? Yeah, so Jasmine's, I, yeah, go ahead, Jasmine. That's a great. I was just saying, it, it's a great practice, you know, just yeah. simply turning the label over and reading them. And I think that the more you do it, you'll start to be able to very easily spot, you know, um, ingredients that you know are, are not healthy for you, for us. Um, it's just about being conscious and being, proactive in how you choose to take care of yourself and not just blindly buying something and assuming that it's safe because it's sold on somebody's shelf somewhere. Because that's not true, unfortunately. I want to circle back to an action item that you brought up. Thank you, Jasmine. I'm going to circle back to an action item um, that's also a solution that you brought up, Tamara, and that is push for policies. So what does that what does that look like? So I know in our, I specialize in hair loss and one of ours is um, the Crown Act being very important. And for that, we literally, well, we got it passed in Maryland already, but for states that don't have the Crown Act, for example, um, we literally tell people to search Crown Act in your state and you'll find the politician who has written the bill and needs support and then how to reach out to them. So the policies that you're referring to Samara, I mean, with this broad audience that this webinar has, how would they go about doing that? I mean, it's yeah. a great solution and it takes the responsibility off of the consumer, which is what you're bringing up. So what is that action item? I think a lot of the changes that we're starting to see are occurring at the state level. So I think sometimes we think only at the federal level that we need to change policies at the federal level. But I think here in the US, a lot of the state level work has been really, you know, pushing forward national level change. And I'll give some examples um, in California over, oh, you, know, you know, the past, you know, 
uh, 10 plus years. There's been a lot of changes around the transparency of what uh, companies need to be adding um, to, you know, provide consumers with ingredients listing. Um, you know, it never, mm -hmm. for example, dawned on me that like in the context of when you go to a salon that in, you know, the, the products that salons were using in these kind of bulk containers did not contain information about the ingredients in the same way mm -hmm. that um, products, um, you know, that, that we purchase, you know, kind of over the counter or, you know, this issue of nail polish, you know, and, and thinking about um, how do we, you know, make change around policies. It's not just about the chemicals themselves. It's about people who also work in these industries. So you, you think about pregnant populations, like what's happening to folks who are, you know, pregnant and they're, you know, working in hair salons or nail salons and so on. So, so much of, of these changes, like, it, it, you know, again, California and other states have really been um, kind of the incubators for thinking about policy change. And a lot of that has come from grassroots movements that have happened around campaigns and initiatives that where folks who are on the ground and, you know, trying to fight for change have partnered with, um, you know, state um, and, and local leaders, mm -hmm. as well as scientists to bring these issues to the attention and awareness to, to make change. So what I would say to folks who are interested is, you know, whether that's, you know, your issue, the thing that you want to focus on is maybe bringing more transparency. I think a lot of people don't understand Jasmine's point. They they do think that, oh, it's on the shelf. That means it's been vetted. That's not the way that consumer products work in this country and certainly not in the U.S., um, right, um, right. You know, personal care products. So if you want that kind of policy change, um, you know, starting at the state level, because the, the reality is that in order for a company to be profitable, they're not going to make a gazillion different types of product for the U.S. market. So the minute that those changes start happening at the state level, that actually does impact what happens, you know, as far as what's being sold. Mm -hmm. And I, I give the example um, there because the European Union, for example, has banned, you know, many of the, the chemicals that we continue to use. There is the EU version of, yep. a, of a personal care product. <laughs> yeah. And then there's yes. the US version of the personal yes. care product. Same company. Look at Coca Cola. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, look at Nivea. Exactly. Nivea mm -hmm. in US versus in Europe is like a completely different product. <laughs> completely different. So, what will it take? I think part of that is getting involved in local initiatives, in state level initiatives not being afraid to use your voice. I also think, Shoshana, a big, big part of this, um, influencers have power <laughs> and they their ability to use their voices and you know, healthcare professionals have power and their ability to use their voices. And I think there's a lot of key stakeholders that need to step up, educate themselves and learn more about ways in which they can get involved in really pushing this forward. Absolutely. Uh, such a great example um, of California over and over being a little bit ahead of the rest of the country in this. Let me, let's switch over to um, questions from our audience that are live with us now. This one is from Dr. Joy Baker. I often get questions about the safety of hair dye, relaxers, et cetera, during pregnancy. I am clear about the link between lie relaxers and fibroids in black slash brown women, but what about other hair care products? So I, I can start if that's okay um, in answering that. Something that we've spent a lot spent a lot of time in, uh, looking at. Um, so some years ago, we decided to look at maintenance related products like hair oils and lotions and leave-in conditioners, things that folks use regularly, whether that's weekly, you know, daily. And it's worth noting that the scalp is one of the most porous, um, you know, body parts. So when we're putting things on 
uh, our heads, whether that's dye, relaxers, whatever. But in this case, something that's repeatedly used and often not washed out for, you know, periods of time, this is able to be absorbed into, into our bodies. So some, some key factors that we found, hair oils seem to pretty consistently show um, a bad signal as far as um, whether we were looking at, um, you know, preterm birth related factors, or um, in this, you know, in other cases, looking at, we found associations with blood pressure um, elevations in pregnancy and lower birth weight. And so we're talking about daily hair oil use looks like, for example, it's associated with having an infant that is, to, is, is 300 grams lower in birth weight. And that's clinically significant. We're also talking about, um, you know, saying- Wait, what do you mean by hair oil? Are you talking about grease? That's a vast- Yeah, like the grease that, you know- out. When you and it's not just oiling your scalp. It's like people will put that on their you know hair. They're thinking, oh, I'm just putting it on my ends and I'll brush it in. Well, you know, when you brush it in, you didn't have to grease your scalp, but like, you know, the type of grease that folks are that, that folks are using to kind of quote unquote moisturize um, their their hair. And we now, don't I, get. I, oh, go ahead. Does does that include essential oils that are placed in the hair? So that is something that we're looking into. And what what I one of the things I will point out is hair oils seem to also carry um, the highest, the highest kind of concentrations of these fragrance-related chemicals. So like folks who are using these have much higher concentrations of these things like phthalates, for example. Mm-hmm. And and again, going add, sorry. No, no, go I ahead. Wish- I was just gonna. I was gonna say in regards to oils, um, a lot of the oils that I think uh, people are buying too, um, they're being packaged mm-hmm. in plastic, and mm-hmm. plastic and oil do not do well together. Any sort of oil product that's packaged in plastic, the the plastic has the ability to actually leach into the oil Good product, point. which is then going onto your skin, your hair into your, into your body. So I think that there's definitely a connection there as well. It's not necessarily, someone had mentioned olive oil, like there's nothing wrong with olive oil, like not an olive oil. Actually, I'm gonna jump in there. So olive oil is not good for your hair and skin. It actually increases what's called the TEWL, the trans epidermal water loss. So it actually dries your hair and skin out a little bit more. It also increases the growth of the yeast malassezia that leads to um, dandruff and other related diseases. So generally as dermatologists, we actually do not like olive oil for the hair or the skin. We also don't like um, lavender, rosemary, and tea tree oil and to be left on. If it's rinsed off, we're fine. But um, we're really picky if it's something that's left on your skin and not rinsed out. You probably, you probably plant that seed um, Tamara. And again, we're not worried about natural or not natural. We're concerned about toxic or not toxic. Yeah. And I I think I just want to piggyback onto what you're saying, Shoshana, because it's a really important point. I'll get asked oftentimes, well, what about essential oils? You know, if the, if there's a number of products on the market, right. That kind of market themselves as natural. And what they've done is they've added things like tea tree oil or lavender and so on. And what we know about many of these is that they are also operating um, as kind of hormonally disrupting the body's normal processes or otherwise known as if you hear this term, I will use it. It's very clunky, endocrine disrupting uh, properties. Um, So we know that lavender and tea tree oil have the ability to, to really disrupt the endocrine system too. So in the context of an essential oil, that's not necessarily they're going to replace it's not automatically, natural is not automatically no. um safe unfortunately no there's a lot of natural um angry or natural elements that are completely top like lead mercury <laughs> like these are natural very obvious ones yes yes we can't, yeah we can't use those <laughs> but yeah, yeah not all talk- essential oils mm-hmm. are, are safe for people this is true and, and Shoshana, I think that one of the questions here about kind of which oils would you recommend, you know, um, as a as a clinical provider, like 
you know, I, I get asked that question a lot too, um, but I, I'm curious, like, what would you recommend? Because I think that a lot of folks will say like, you know, I'm going to gravitate towards like an olive oil or a coconut oil or something like yeah. that. So coconut oil really irritates my patients with eczema, right? So we tend to not recommend that too, too often. And if using it as like a lotion for dry skin, the oils, the butter, shea butter, for example, coconut, cocoa butter, um, just turns into an oil. So that's counting as an oil too. And it doesn't um, create that protective barrier that we want for eczema. So generally for eczema, we don't have our patients use those. Um, for the hair though, because this really came from the hair, so far we see no issues with argon and grapeseed. Um, generally avocado, we haven't seen an issue. And somebody's gonna come up with something new. Someone told me, um, black seed oil a few years ago, chibi oil is way too new for us to have seen a clinical um, adverse effect. And I haven't known anyone to scientifically study it yet. Uh huh. Uh, what about jojoba? We haven't seen any issue with jojoba either. So there's more, there's, there's, there's probably more we can use and just a list, a short list of things that we say don't. So I'll give you that list just to put it all in one part of this webinar and that is olive oil, rosemary, lavender, and tea tree oil so far are the ones we have um, patients not leave on. And then be gentle when it comes to lemongrass because I get contact dermatitis from that and from vinegar, uh, a lot of contact dermatitis. I wanna try to answer the other questions that are on here real quick. Um, is there a significant difference between toxic stabilizers antimicrobials, et cetera, and less harmful alternatives. That would be for either of you. Um, is there a significant sure. cast difference is what it says. Is there a significant cast? I'm not sure what that means, cast difference. Let me go to the next one and then oh, maybe that's cost difference. Cost difference. Oh, um, oh cost yes. Difference. That's an interesting <laughs> question. There, there, there can be, not always, but there can be. And the, the cost really just kind of comes down to um, the cost of goods, of what it costs to formulate um, for each individual brand. Um, certain ingredients cost more than others, and that obviously affects the cost. But cost is not just, like the cost that you're, you're paying for a product isn't just the ingredients that you're paying for. You're also paying for the packaging, you're paying for the marketing, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. So, and all of that is built into the cost of the actual product. I also just want to make note of something that I think is really important. I, I, I often think in the, you know, clean beauty space, um, I'll hear pushback or argument that women of color won't purchase, you know, clean products, that there's not much of a market for that. I remember now about 10 years ago, pitching um, to a, a, company to, you know, really identify, you know, it's kind of serve this, this market in this niche. And they said, it's just no way they're not going to buy it. It's too expensive. And A, that's unacceptable. That's not what the market data shows. We, right. We, we color, are they're not sure. carrying the market on this. You know, uh, so I have most, most of my customers are women of color. So, I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's, um, I think we have to do some myth busting essentially. Busting, yes, yes. Um, but I also think we did that about vegan, vegan and vegetarian and whole foods, whatever. It couldn't be further from the truth. It just it couldn't. Just yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's biased. very, very biased. Yeah. You know. In fact, I don't know if you guys know this, but the biggest uh, demographic of vegans um, are black people. There are more black vegans than there are any other demographic. Um, I believe it. I don't know the data behind it. That's amazing, Jasmine. There's a huge misconception also about the cost of clean beauty. Yes. Like I've heard it all. Clean beauty is so expensive. It's too expensive. Yeah, you do have a lot of um, beauty brands that are like on the more prestige side on the, in the clean beauty um, niche, but you also have some that are very accessible. I'm talking like under $30, you know, 20 bucks like at Pretty Well Beauty. I have a I have a, yeah, we have face serums that cost $125, but we also have really great face serums that cost $25 that are amazing and completely clean and safe and natural. So that's 
the Helpful. price ranges are, are definitely much more vast um, within this area. So it's not mm -hmm. all, it's not all inaccessibly priced. And Jasmine, I'm just curious. I'm sorry. I just wanted to no, ask, ask a mm -hmm. follow-up on that because I think there's opportunity here. Do you, do, are you seeing with more folks, I mean, there's both this mixed bag of like more folks are coming to the marketplace with clean beauty products, but do you, are you also seeing some, you know, variability in, in hopefully a decrease in prices because there's more on the market that is available for, for people of color. And so kind of just the, the supply and demand and, and all of that, is that something that you're seeing? A little bit. I, I think we still have a, a, a lot, a lot more room to grow in that area to make it more accessible. Obviously, the more demand, um, you know, that companies have with the ingredients that they're sourcing, the that's going to definitely re reflect in the pricing. But you also have to take into consideration some of these ingredients that are being used in clean beauty oftentimes are expensive. Some of these mm -hmm. ingredients, they're mm -hmm. because they're rare and they're hard to source. And mm -hmm. they that that's what determines that that drives up the cost. Mm -hmm. um, but, and there's nothing you can do about it because they're not making these ingredients in the lab. Like you have to work with nature. And when you're working with ingredients that are limited supply and they only grow in certain parts of the world and you're working like with my brands, like they're so picky they're not going to just take ingredients from just anywhere they want to make mm -hmm. sure they're getting the best sources of them and so like for example one of one of the brands that I carry like they have this one product and um, it was out of stock for a year because the crops for um, one of the main ingredients oh, wow. had, they had, they had a bad season so they couldn't they couldn't produce the product for an entire year so the way clean beauty is just is formulated, it's 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 just very very different than say like you know mass produced or commercial um, um, products, and that it is reflective in the cost. But it's not to say that there aren't accessible options. When you know like a good example, there's this brand called um, Honey Girl Organics. They're based out of Hawaii. They work with a lot of local um, growers out there, mm -hmm. and that's a and they, um, there, there's co-ops and everything's done sustainably. I think, yeah, I think their most expensive product is around $55, but it's for a serum, you know? But they have moisturizers mm -hmm. that are in the $30 range. Um, they have body creams that are in the $20 range. So it really just, it, it, I've seen it, I've seen such a wide, um, you know, variation in pricing, but I understand why the pricing is, why it is, and it's and it always is because like because of the greens. I think one of the one of the other big differentiators in terms of how things are priced um, with clean beauty versus say like mass prestige or prestige is that um, clean beauty brands are investing the majority of their dollars in the actual product, like the ingredients, versus let's say Chanel or La Mer. You're paying for the name. <laughs> you're paying for that packaging you're paying for that to be a part of this this you know elite um group of people who can afford la mer and la prairie and all of these things you're not paying for quality ingredients you're paying for maybe one quality mm -hmm. ingredient but the rest is like fillers and like water and you know such a, good oil, point. Like such a good point that is such a good point um expensive doesn't necessarily mean improved quality it doesn't. Um, excellent. Well, it's great as you're there to guide your consumers at your store. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a great question that Stacy has asked, and it's fragrance is a huge reason uh, for why people buy, right? Some people even smell their food before they take a bite. How should mm -hmm. less harmful fragrances be labeled and recognized? So this is a really, it's funny. I literally have customers who will come in asking for a moisturizer and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll ask them a bunch of questions before I even determine what product to recommend to them. But then I'll put some on their hand and they'll smell it. And they're like, yeah. oh, I don't like Immediately. So they won't use it. I'm like, that should never be a determining, that should never be a factor in how you buy your skincare. One, because 
fragrance is not necessary. It's it it doesn't it doesn't add to um, any sort of benefits to why you're using a facial moisturizer. And two, even if you liked the smell of it, the scent is going to dissipate after a couple of minutes anyway. So it doesn't matter. It's like I don't you don't need to use your skincare as fragrance. If it to me, and I would say this jokingly, but I actually kind of mean it. I don't care if it smells like dog poop. If it works, I'm going to use it, period. And if okay. someone's putting, <laughs> but I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a little hardcore, like, you know, but if someone is buying a facial product or whatever, and it's very, you know, there's a scent to it and, and the scent is coming from fragrance, you know, that that hot topic word fragrance that we say not to, you know, run to, we say to run away from, because as um, Dr. James Todd mentioned, that is, it's a proprietary ingredient and it's comprised of anywhere from a dozen to hundreds of ingredients. And we don't know what any of that is. So yeah, it, it, should, mm -hmm. it should be something that you, you would wanna avoid. There's no reason to have a fragrance in your facial care products or even, in your body care, your hair care, it, it serves no purpose other than an oral, you know, a, a sensorial experience. I know people like it. They want to feel like they're having a beautiful moment and they want to enjoy the, the lathering of the product and everything. But at, it, at what expense? Is it worth compromising your endocrine system? Is it worth triggering potential allergies? Is it, is it worth flaring up potential skin issues? I don't think it is, um, but you know, that's, that's just, yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna jump in really quickly because I know we're getting low on time. And I'll just yeah. also say that, um, you know, what I don't want folks to leave with today is this idea of, okay, well now I have to throw out everything I have in my, you know, um, makeup, cabinet and, you know, not use anything and never smell <laughs> the way I want to smell or whatever that I, I, I want to debunk that I, um, you know, first of all, you know, consider opportunities where you can replace products as you run out of one, maybe consider where you might identify uh, safer products, ways in which you can do that. Sure. We talked about reading labels today, but other strategies, because not everyone needs to be a chemist, is to utilize apps that are available. Um, there are a variety of apps ranging from Claria to Detox Me um, to um, the EWG Skin Deep app, some of which will, you know, give you quantitative scores. In other words, they'll rate rate the, the product safety uh, based on a score from essentially one to 10, with 10 being, you know, most harmful and they'll give you, in some cases, alternatives, you know? So, okay, I really, you know, truth be told, I love perfume. Someone asked in uh, the q and I just, I love smelling good. Do I use it? Do I do that every day? No. Did I once upon a time used to? Absolutely. Um, I, I loved opening up my grandmother's, um, you know, uh, cabinets and drawers and, and pulling out all the different perfumes. So it's, it's I think it's about, you know, when when able to consider replacing, when you need to think about um, strategies for replacement, consider some of these app-based, um, um, you know, things that you can use um, that, you know, uh, some of them are better than others when it comes to women of color. Um, I also think that um, there's opportunity, again, for being able to um, check in, get involved in, in policy changes. And I just, I wanted to make that big push. And like I said, at the, at some point in this, that there are also resources online, like this, um, uh, non-toxic black beauty project that actually is for not just, uh, pregnant people, but for industry leaders, retailers, and so on, um, that can get involved in, in identifying, uh, products that can be safer. Um, Dr. James Todd, I'm going to allow you to wrap. I'm going to answer two questions that were directed to me, but mine will be very succinct. And the first one is, how do you approach hair loss during pregnancy? What causes it? So there's 15 different forms of hair loss. 
there's a postpartum shedding called tetrahydrin effluvium. But during uh, pregnancy, we're really, really conservative. Um, we want no relaxers, no jerry curls. Don't braid your hair tightly, et cetera. Just literally baby your hair. The next question was, um, are there concerns of wearing wigs or extensions while pregnant? Um, just so long as you don't allow the wig to rub your hair out and cause traction alopecia. So we normally recommend, recommend a product called the Wig Grip Cap that can be purchased online. And then is the hair treated with chemicals um, that we should avoid? And that answer is yes. There seems to be an increase in the um, toxins added to hair. Similar to clothing where they add um, a wrinkle relaxer, which is why our eczema patients have to wash their new clothes first. There's something about hair extensions. And so the trend of washing the hair with shampoo or soaking it in, in apple cider vinegar, we're actually um, for that. All right, Dr. James Todd, I'll hand it over to you to wrap us up. Um, so I'll just, um, again, make note that um, there are a lot of different resources. And one of the, the other pieces, if you're interested in learning more, hearing more about uh, these products, how they impact our health, how they impact pregnancy uh, specifically, please uh, feel free to connect to us um, in the ERJ lab um, um, with the Beauty Plus Justice podcast. I had a chance to interview um, Dr. Kindred, um, really wonderful episode where you can learn more about um, these products and hair loss um, if, you, if you're interested, as well as other um, issues. And um, and then lastly, um, um, do feel free to, and I can probably, I don't know if I can put it in the chat, um, take a look at some of these other resources, again, with respect to apps and um, um, this um, safe cosmetics um, opportunity with the uh, red list. I, I will finish there because I think we're at time, but. We are at time. So Dr. James uh, Todd. How did I forget your name? Tamara. <laughs> and, and I don't know, Tamara and uh, Jasmine, thank you for um, birthing the magic. I'd like to thank Marie Boone Clark for inviting us. And I want to encourage everyone to watch the webinar tomorrow. Tomorrow, the webinar is Check Your Bias at the Door. I will be watching that one. And I'm still in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, it puts melanated mamas at risk tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern and breastfeeding while black, normalizing and, and educating and empowering. And that's 7 p.m. Eastern. And everyone, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. So lovely meeting you, both of you. Same, same.